like you said, you, you do realise you've got a 22% chance increased risk of, of dying of a heart attack within the next 10 years. And I said, well, thank you for that, but no. And he said, so you really don't want it, even after what I've just said. You know, you've got a, an increased risk of dying. And I said, no. Ian, how did you find Carnivore? Um, well, I knew that one was coming. Uh, I would go back to my childhood. I think a lot of people have done this, where you know it all started off with treats and one thing or another, and I suppose diet. Uh, you know, my my parents were actually very good cooks. They cooked everything from fresh. Um, but you know, it was the standard Western diet. Although, having said that, my father really enjoyed cooking Indian, Chinese, Greek, a whole range of different cuisines. But, um, yeah, I, I think in, in my childhood, one of my earliest childhood memories is sneaking into the kitchen and pinching the uh, maraschino cherries uh, that my mother was keeping for a cake or pinching icing off a cake that she'd already made. And certainly through my school days, it was, it was a nasty habit that that stayed with me for, for my own, pretty well my entire life. Um, and then, you know, after that, learning to cook and just eating what seemed to be an appropriate diet with plenty of carbs and fresh vegetables and meat. And initially, that really wasn't a problem. Um, you know, I was young, I was fit, I did a lot of exercise, and it didn't really hit me for, for many years. Uh, but I suppose from university onwards, uh, things started to change. Um, yeah, and you know, university again, I was, I was cooking, I was exercising, I was doing a lot of, lot of exercise. But then getting into work, I went into sales, which is quite high pressure. I was traveling a lot and eating far too much, I suppose, and then the wrong things. Um, I traveled a lot in Eastern Europe, so drinking was part of the culture. And I put on weight, and it didn't matter how much exercise I did, it just carried on going up. Um, and then, you know, I'm by the time I was in my 40s, 50s, it was up to 20 stone or 120 kilos, somewhere around there. And as I said, I, no matter how much exercise I did, it wouldn't shift. And it was really only 18 months ago. You know, I, I had tried lots of other diets. I tried the, the cabbage soup, the British Heart Foundation diet, the Atkins diet. A diet, you know, a whole string of different diets, and they, they really didn't make any difference. And as it was only 18 months ago when I discovered low carb, that things started to shift. And then low carb, keto, intermittent fasting, and eventually, much more recently, going carnivore. So, what was your introduction to carnivore? Um, essentially, just that. I had already gone low carb. I'd already gone you know, to intermittent fasting, and that certainly helped. Um, keto helped uh, purely restricting hours, uh, restricting the range of foods, cutting out all the processed stuff, all the seed oils, all the all the carbohydrates. And I lost fifteen kilos and felt a lot better. Um, went back to cycling to work. Um, just being more active, feeling much better. But there were some residual issues, and it's mainly skin issues that, that I thought needed to be addressed. And that was where I thought, okay, so cut out the cheese, cut out the milk products, um, and cut out pretty well all the vegetables. I, I now very rarely eat vegetables. I still have some. But um, certainly not the range that I would I used to have, and that made a again a huge difference. I think uh, skin issues are clearing up, and I feel a lot more satiated. Like I can eat 
just uh, today, for instance, I've had what did I have? Some tallow, a um, couple of little bits of air dried sausage. That's it. And the rest of the day was just water. Wow. So that that um, doesn't sound like you're eating um, all that much, but you're you're satiated. Yeah, I mean, it was, that was interesting. I was watching uh, the program earlier on today with Gig, and what struck me about his thing was, was uh, the bowel habits. It's like, I don't need to go to the toilet. <laughs> because, uh, A, I'm not eating much, and B, what I'm eating is, is going into the small intestine, and it's spending a long time in there until there's basically very little left. My body is, is utilising all of those fats and proteins and there's pretty well nothing left to come out the other end the the carnivore part um you found low carb 18 months ago how long has yeah. it been carnivore for you uh only really well i suppose define carnivore if, if it's strict carnivore then only a week or so um if it is I suppose ketovore or something along those lines, then probably for the last six months. Um, but you know, not not being too hard on myself. If if I fancy some mushrooms or an onion or something like that, then I I will have it. It's not that I am being what people would call extremist, and I think that that's a, a misplaced term. But um, you know, it, it's not going hard carnivore it, it's just seeing how it goes and seeing what it does for me and adapting as i need to but certainly you know everything i've read and i mean back 18 months ago i read an awful lot um starting off i think the first person i saw was robert lustig uh with the you know the, the, the sugar um video that he did um, but then other people, Ken Berry, um, Dave Feldman, Ben Bickman, you know, a whole range of really, really useful um, presenters who, who go over different aspects of it. And then just looking to see what each one is saying, where's the, the clinical evidence, reading quite a lot of the, the research papers, and essentially re reassuring myself that what they're saying is clinically validated that it has some basis and ben ben bigman i find particularly useful from that point of view is that he's not promoting anything particularly he's just explaining the basic science and that really appeals to me as you know particularly when it comes to something like the uh, the lipid uh, heart hypothesis what is the basis of that and how does that really work compared to what you know, Ben is saying, and, and it doesn't tally, you know, the, the mechanism isn't explained by the lipid heart hypothesis. Therefore, I really shouldn't have any fear of fat. I shouldn't have any fear of cholesterol, provided that my, my blood values are okay. And it was only right. uh, yeah, about a month and a half ago or something like that, I, I had a blood test, you know, I was invited to have one because just sort of routine thing from the, the GP surgery and the results came back and I had a look at them and then contacted you know, I was recommended to make a, an appointment with the GP because my LDL was high and my sugar was high and one thing or another and I thought okay so I'll, I'll phone make an appointment and he called me back and he said um, your LDL is, is very high I said, yeah. And he said, uh, I think you should be on a statin. I just said, okay. He said, no, I think you should really be on a statin. And I said, well, no, with, uh, you know, thanks, but I don't think I should. And he said, you do realize you've got a 22% chance, increased risk of, of dying of a heart attack within the next 10 years. And I said, well, thank you for that, but no. He said, so you really don't want it, even after what I've just said. You know, you've got a, an increased risk of dying. And I said, no. He said, okay, let's move on. <laughs> and you know, he went to my, my blood sugar, which was 5.9 uh, millimoles per mole, 
or whatever. I can't remember the exact figure, but it was it was slightly up. And I think that was purely a result of cortisol. But, you know, I went for a blood test. I hadn't been for a blood test for years. I was expecting it wasn't just a blood test. It was a health review. But, um, you know, I, I was nervous, and, and that probably stimulated cortisol, which stimulates glucagon release, which increases the output of, of glucose from the liver. So I think that's perfectly normal. I've measured it at home, and it, it's always within clinically acceptable levels. But, you know, looking back at the, the blood results that I had, I did my own analysis of that. And the triglyceride to HDL ratio was 1.8, so 1.18 which is well within the recommended limit. So I have no concerns about the, the high LDL. Right. And so uh, along the way, have you been on any meds that you've been able to get off? <laughs> no. <laughs> years ago, years ago I was. I, mean, I, I was on statins many years ago and gave them up because I, I didn't feel any better for them and they, they made my muscles ache and that kind of thing. Um, and I have been on lots of medications in the past. You know, and I went through periods of, of severe depression and I was on loads of different uh, medications then, antihypertensives and um, diuretics and antidepressants um, and one thing or another and uh didn't feel any better for any of them frankly but for, certainly for the last year and a half i've not had anything apart from thyroxine I, I have no thyroid gland um and that's another thing i, I wonder whether um that was back in 2006 and I, I had my thyroid removed and i wonder whether had i known now uh, then what i know now whether that would have been necessary um, it wasn't a definite cancer diagnosis. It was a, you know, a nodule in my thyroid that probably came from my diet. You know, if your fat metabolism is disrupted, then everything's disrupted. Uh, all your hormones are out of kilter. Everything's out of kilter. and You can expect your, your digestion, your hormone production, everything to be off. Right. Yeah. So, um, like, how how are you feeling as far as um, mood and things like that since you've been eating this way? Really good. Um, you know, and I, I do a, a fairly stressful job, and I find that these days I, I don't get depressed. I don't get down. Occasionally, you know, I mean, stress will get on the top on top of me, but I'm much more balanced, much more calm, uh, much more energetic. I feel that you know, I, I, I have plenty of energy today. For instance, I've had to collect the the car from the garage, and, and rather than get the bus, I walked an hour, um, and you know, I didn't feel puffed out at all. Whereas a couple of years ago, I was up at 20 stone, my knees hurt, everything hurt, you know, my shoulders ached and just basically felt really, really unfit, unwell. Um, now, no problem. I'm, I'm much more balanced and much happier and much healthier. What do the people around you think about this way of eating? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, I, I have... Not really discussed it in detail, but you know, I, I can tell other people, I mean, I, I get, get comments about, you know, you, isn't that rather a lot of meat or um, why aren't you eating or, <laughs> um, you know, all that fat will, will give you a heart attack. I still get that stuff. And, yeah, nobody in my, my close circle seems to understand it or wants to understand it um that they're still stuck with the, the usual algorithms you need to eat fiber you need carbohydrates you need cut fat and all the rest of it uh there are you know all those myths that, that i found initially so 
challenging when I started low carb. Um, you know, the, the fear of fat, the fear of cholesterol, the fear of eating too many eggs or too much meat or too much saturated fat. It, it all delayed, I suppose, my my initial adoption of this lifestyle. But it is a lifestyle. It's not just about the diet. And once I got over that, I'm convinced, you know, I've read enough clinical papers, I've listened to enough talks. Um, about a, you know, a couple of months after I started, I came across something called the Public Health Collaboration, which is a UK charity. And I went to the, the annual conference and it was just an eye opener. It's like all these people believe what I believe. Um, so it was just, just really reassuring to hear, I mean, Ben Bickman was there, Ken Berry was there, um, Sean Baker, you know, and a whole range of, of different speakers who said what I'd been listening to anyway, but, you know, just hearing them live and then all the audience and you know, mingling with them at the breaks and, and talking about what's your journey um, and just hearing really reassuring things about what it has done for people. And that, that was just uh, a real boost. Uh, I went to the conference again this year, and it, it's just such a lovely community. You know, there's no judgment about whether you want to go vegan, you want to go plant-based, you want to go keto or carnivore, um, low-carb, whatever you're doing, as long as it is working, it's working. Um, yeah. Um, uh, do you think that's important to have the community around you? It certainly helps. Um you know, it, it, it's otherwise a very lonely place sometimes. And I, that I have been, since since I joined the, the public health collaboration, I've also been giving talks at work um, to my colleagues. And I do feel I'm, I'm out on a limb sometimes. You know, the, at work they have Teams chats, and one of the Teams chats is uh, the vegan network. It's like the, the, there's a network. Why haven't we got a carnivore network or a low carb network or something like that? Um, and no, I haven't yet. I, mean, I, I haven't proposed it. It's something that I'm, I'm thinking about proposing is, is a, just a, a low carb or a, a real food network um, as a, a counterpoint to the plant based agenda, which. I sense all over the place. I mean, there was something in The Guardian that came up on LinkedIn today, an article in The Guardian about um, harmful residues in food. And it was stressing that, you know, these, these happen in meat, these happen in eggs, they, they happen in rice. Um, but if you eat uh, a plant-based diet, they, they happen less. It's like, how does that work? How does that work? I mean, how can it possibly be that the fruit and veg are excluded from the, the toxins that get into our soil, that are sprayed on plants, that get into the food chain one way, one way or another? Uh, it, it does not make any sense that, that other plants will not be affected if rice is affected, or that, or that, uh, that um, plants will not be affected if, if animals are affected by toxins in the soil. So it's so pervasive. It's so um, so powerful. Such a powerful message about you know the green agenda and protecting the planet and not hurting animals and all the rest of it. Um, that that can be a, a, a very isolating thing if you are the only carnivore in the room. So yes, I mean the community is is important. Yeah. So you said you've given some talks about it at work. How have they gone down? Good. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where it's team presentation. It's not a live um, chat or a room full of people, which I always find, you know, when I've, I've done a lot of training in my life, and, and I always find that much easier than this team's things where all I can see is, uh, maybe my photo or my my video or 
the presentation that I'm giving and I can't see any reactions. It's very difficult to judge whether people are on their smartphones or gone to get a coffee or sleep, frankly. Um, but you know, the, the feedback that I get from those who feedback is, is good. But, you know, what I'm presenting is useful information that they've learned something new. Um, there are a few people who, who have made changes as a result. And in some cases, some, some quite important changes, you know, going low carb, uh, changing the way that they exercise. I mean, there's, there's one guy who is incredibly fit and incredibly um, active and, and really looking after his health. And the other day I said to him, you know, the one thing that would concern me is your stress levels. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, if you are incredibly active, it doesn't necessarily protect against visceral adiposity you know, wrap around your liver, your kidneys, your heart, uh, which in the, the role that he's in, you know, where his cortisol levels, his adrenaline levels are extremely high, I mean extremely high, um, that that will predispose to build up of fat in and around the organs, or in the liver and around the, the kidneys and heart. And he said, you know what? I'd be wondering why I couldn't shift this tire. <laughs> He's very slim, but, you know, he had this little little uh, bulge just below his rib cage. I said, well, that's possibly what it is. You, know, you, you just need to find ways to manage the stress levels and ensure mm. that you're not uh, building up the fat where it shouldn't be yeah that the stress is really dangerous mm. absolutely stress levels generally i mean if you look at the stress levels in the workplace stress levels in society um the the, the rates of depression anxiety all of the other things which go hand in hand with a high high carb diet um, are astronomical and growing. You know, all of the metabolic disorders predispose to that. Um, uh, it's not just association. You, you can actually explain that. You, you look at uh, another author that I've been looking at, another publisher that I've been looking at is, is Chris Palmer. Chris Palmer and Georgia Ede looking at uh, the effect of a keto diet on serious mental conditions and the, the clear link between leaky gut and what Chris Palmer would call insulin resistance of the brain or you know, type 3 insulin resistance, uh, type 3 diabetes, that uh, you know, mental illness and, and dementia are not just related to, by, but caused by um, that leak of, of toxins through the the leaky gut into the bloodstream through the blood brain barrier uh the insulin resistance in the brain then also ensures that you you effectively starved of energy where it counts and you know when you work in an office environment you get into the habit of you know just feeling like i've just got to get over this hump just got to get all this work done and things are going to be okay and every day i've got to clear all this work from my desk and then you know that means I'm doing a good job and it's so stressful and your stress mm. levels just go up. And, you know, I, I came to a realization about this, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago. And it's like, there's always going to be more work. No, it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter how much work I clear off my desk today. There's always going to be more work tomorrow. So what am I stressing about? It's just not worth it. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I believe in doing a job and doing it properly. I think doing, trying to get it right first time, trying to get it right for the customer. Um, but it is it's pushing water uphill. That, that's my analogy. It's pushing water uphill because it never stops. It cannot stop. It, it has to keep going and you have to keep going, just pushing the water up the hill. <laughs> Uh, and when you go away at night, it's going to keep flowing. You know, it's, it's just, that's life. And yeah. I have to be grateful that I have a job and that, you know, it seems to be reasonably secure. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, there, there are other, I've done lots of different types of work. I've done sales. I worked, worked as a radiographer. I worked as a, a massage therapist. So, you know, a whole range of, of different environments. And certainly working as a massage therapist was far preferable in terms of stress levels, but uh, you know, generating an income that way is, is a lot more challenging. Yeah, so um, if you were offering advice to someone about how to get started with carnivore, um, what what would be that advice? Um, I think the, the key things are to look at insulin levels. You can't actually, you probably won't get those measured. Um, stress, you know, your stress levels, and what you're eating. You know, the idea that you are what you eat is misleading. Um, eating fat doesn't make you fat. Eating grass doesn't make you a cow. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. Um, but certainly if you can firstly restrict the amount of time that you spend eating each day, restrict the, the window for eating, uh, as in it's intermittent fasting, I go 16, 8, go... Uh, 184 whatever 186 18, rather um you no know, just find a, a comfortable point where you can eat within that window and eat to satiety and then also cut out all the the refined carbohydrates all the ultra processed foods all the seed oils um that's a, a good place to start nice so Ian, do you have any way of reaching out to you if people want to get in contact? Any social media? Um, I, I, I can put stuff in the chat. Um, I have Facebook. I have uh, LinkedIn. Sure. So I'll link to I'll link to both of those below. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate your time. Oh, pleasure. It, it's it. Uh, <laughs> I think with the quote that I came across the other day, you know, don't tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what you can't live without saying. And it's not like I'm going to pop my clogs if I don't tell anyone. But certainly after the, um, you know, the, the conference last year, I, I wanted to go out and tell anyone. If, if, I, if I can say something that is going to save somebody from... Uh, progressing down the road to type 2 diabetes or help them get out of it, then I'll die happier.